Hi, this is Meg Riley, and you've joined us for another episode of The View. Today, I'm at 24 Farnsworth at the UUA headquarters in Boston, Massachusetts. So I am not in my usual hometown of Minneapolis. Great to be with you. Christina, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm uh, phoning in from Charlottesville, Virginia, where we've been um, making prep for hurricane weather, which is now looking like it's going to miss us, but it's definitely, um, you know, hitting other areas. And I just want to give a shout out to the UU congregations that are um, in that path. And just a reminder that the UUA um, offices can help you if you need, have immediate needs um, related to disaster relief afterwards. Um, and also to just remind folks that there are uh, folks in Puerto Rico that had a hurricane much larger than this um, last year and are still without, uh, in some areas, basic services. So. Amen. Michael Tino. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. Um, it's good to be back. I'm sorry I missed the season opener last last week. I am I'm following in the the footsteps of my great co-hosts here on the view and actually taking care of my health so <laughs> i i hope that's i hope that's appreciated by someone other than my husband and my child but uh i i encourage i encourage you all to do that it's, it's great to be back i think we all want oh, everybody here to take care of our health yes indeed good job Jessica Star Rockers. Uh, Jessica here. I am uh, doing tech from the Seattle area. Um, I am going to be on uh, Facebook Live here in the chat, um, getting your questions for our hosts and our guests. I'll be on Twitter, hashtag The View. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here this morning. And, I'm, and I know that Kia is also on the uh, West Coast. So um, solidarity in waking up this early. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I'm really excited that we have the guests today that we do to talk about a topic which is not new at all in the world and not particularly new to Unitarian Universalists, the doctrine of discovery, formerly known as the doctrine of Christian discovery, but shortened to kind of bury the lead a little bit. Um, and so we'll be talking about what new organizing that's going on. Our guests are Reverend Clyde Grubbs, a longtime activist around indigenous issues um, from the Cherokee Nation in Texas and minister at All Souls Church in Braintree, Massachusetts. Welcome Clyde, it's great to see you always. And uh, we also have Kia Bordner and Kia is um, living in San Diego, or she's part of the UU congregation there, a first year student at Meadville. Clyde is her teaching pastor, I love that. She's on the drum steering committee, and um, she has been working on reproductive rights and restorative justice for a long time. Her grandfathers from, were from the Yaqui and, oh darn it, I practiced it too. Yisleta Nations, and you will tell me if I wrecked that. And one of her grandmothers was from an unknown nation. And so we are so glad you're here. And if you could just start by telling us about, it sounds like you just attended a conference on this topic. And what was that? Yes, we did. Uh, do you hear me? I'm just checking my, uh, we were at the, the uh, uh, repudiating the doctrine of discovery, what's next conference in uh, basically in Syracuse, New York and the Onagana nation. And we were there, uh, uh, there were probably half a dozen Unitarian Universalists uh, there in the conference, about 60 people. Uh, indigenous people, religious uh, communities. Uh, and we, uh, the conference is the second time around. It was in 2014, this is 2018. They really plan to start doing it every, uh, much more often now. Uh, and th there was a, a, a a group of scholars and indigenous activists gathered around the University of Syracuse and they created what's called the Doctrine of Discovery Study Group, which provides a forum, a website to, 
to exchange theories and ideas of what, what the, how the doctrine of discovery impacts indigenous law and, and practice in the United States. And that was about 2008. And by 2014, they were ready to have a conference and now 2018. So it's the university and it's in partnership with the, the Onagana Nation and they've created this center called uh, the Great Law of Peace Center, which is based on the Honda Saudi Confederation's uh, peacemaker. That's great. Let's, let's start with some real basics. What is the doctrine of Christian discovery, the doctrine of discovery? When did it come into being and how is it still alive? Either one of you. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I was assigned to take that on. Uh, bef well before uh, the, the time where Europeans got, on, got in boats and started going around looking at the world, there was, there was a whole series of phenomenon which we know as the Crusades. The Crusades were, were uh, efforts on the part of the church, theoretically, to f fight for Christianity, for against Saracens, pagans, etc. So Europe had many indigenous traditions that were crushed by armed might by these crusades, as well as there were crusades launched against the Saracens. So a tradition had been established by, that had gone on for 400 years by that time, and against Jewish people. So there were witch burnings going on in 1492 against indigenous people in, especially women in Europe, so hundreds of thousands. It was serious, serious uh, crusade. So when the, when the Portuguese came back and said that they had, would like to colonize Africa, they were given a crusade. And that was 1455. And, and, and it basically said con uh, conquer and subdue the people of, for, for the glory of Christ. So the, and that was the beginning of the doctrine of discovery. And then the, the Spanish asked for a warrant for what they what Columbus had found when he when he ran into the Bahamas or the Bahamas pe people discovered him and, and helped him get his ship back together. So Columbus made claim to it, and that was 1493. It's, that concept was picked up by all the European nations. Because they were all at that time, I mean, even England was part of the Roman Catholic Church and incorporated into their the, the merger of their the church law and the civil law was complete within very few years. So England was dispatching explorers under the doctrine of discovery to to make claims to North America. So the claims that were made by European powers are the legal basis called the Doctrine of Discovery. When the United States declared independence in 1776, the argument was by the, those founders, all of whom owned land and speculated in land and, and had good reason to make, want to make claim to land that was in the West from part of the Northern, North American continent. But the Doctrine of Discovery enabled the claim of the, the English colonies who had declared independence to the doctrine of discovery that Britain had. So Brit, they, it, it, the argument under the, the United States made is they were the successor nation. And that was the basis, has become the basis in US law, which is cited numerous times in the last five years when making claims against indigenous land claims. Standing Rock was doctrine of discovery. The claims in Arizona, all of those, when you, if you look at what the legal claims are, they're basically the three points of doctrine of discovery, that the, that the indigenous people are uncivilized and therefore should be ruled by Christian nation, the United States, although, and two, that indigenous people only have the right to occupy the land, they have no rights to the land. And three, the indigenous people's awards of the state 
and need to be administered. So those claims are contained in early decisions, for example, against the Cherokee Nation in 1828, which Supreme Court and the and 1820. Was 1828 when the Supreme Court first used the language and, and brought uh, it? I think it was 1822, 23. Okay. Uh, with the actual decision that was around a, a, specul a land speculation case in Ohio, and he and the uh, marshal in court used the whole logic of what the English had done and incorporated it into the Supreme Court decision. It had been talked about. You can read it in Jefferson's little scribblings in his notebooks. I mean, it wasn't like Marshall pulled it out of thin air. It was part of the atmosphere. Part of that. Really helpful framing, Clyde. I've never, I've never really thought of it as as the Inquisition wrought here, but that's what it was. Percent. And yeah, that's that's a really helpful frame for me to think of it. it um, yeah. Well, Manifest Destiny is a Christian crusade. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Kia, anything you'd like to chime in and add to that? Yeah, so, what was most interesting to me was was hearing about court cases and seeing legal documentation where the United States quoted the Doctrine of Discovery. Um, and actually, in 1779, um, George Washington's orders to General John Sullivan, uh, quote, the immediate object of your expedition are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements, the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops in the ground and prevent them planting more. So 1779, George Washington used the doctrine of discovery to say, destroy the, the nation. Mm -hmm. And the most current um, example that was given at this conference was actually in 2014 and involved um, White versus the United States University of California. So here uh, in California. Uh, our Aboriginal interest in land generally is described as the tribe's right to occupy the land. So what Clyde was just talking about. It's not a property right, but it amounts to the right of occupancy, which the sovereign grants and protects against the interests of third parties. That right, which is residual in nature, comes from the legal theory that discovery and conquest gave the conquerors the right to own the land. So that was what was um, just shocking to me was to see that this language is still quoted in law cases in today, uh, not just the big ones that we all hear about, like Standing Rock, um, but anytime there's uh, legal issues with Native peoples, it gets it gets brought out. And I think um, it, it's worth saying. Uh, I mean, the Johnson case in 1823 used the phrase, the courts of the conquerors. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, that was in the, the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court. Um, and that case has been cited um, by the Supreme Court recently in unanimous decisions um, written by people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, who we um, in many other ways would, would really like to respect. Um, but there's, there's something about a Jewish Supreme Court justice citing the Christian doctrine of discovery uh, to strip indigenous people of their right uh, to humanity, basically. Go ahead. The, 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 the church's proclamation, I mean, the church, if you ask the Roman Catholic Church, well, when are you gonna repudiate it? They said, well, we don't have to repudiate it because it, it isn't part of church teaching. So their basic argument that, that from the Roman Catholic point of view is that was something that, that we just, it was just a phase we had back in the, back in the day and forget about it. But it, it's entered into all of the uh, uh, civil laws of all of the countries of the Western hemisphere, Chile, Argentina, they all have doctrine of discovery, Canada. So it's not just the United States and it's part of the law that they cite in their legal thing. And so the, 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 the idea that religious communities are not teaching this is, is, is an, an evasion because it, it was from the religious community that it entered into legal doctrine. 
so it's a legal doctrine and it was a church proclamation. When did they stop saying Christian doctrine of Christian discovery? Is that just been a gradual thing that happens here and there? Because it seems like Ruth Bader Ginsburg isn't talking about the doctrine of Christian discovery, right? And I just wonder how, how the legal people, have they shifted how they frame it or is, they don't care? I mean, it's really about ownership is what it's about. And the civil, the, the, when we're talking about civil law, we're talking about the doctrine of discovery, which is a doctrine under law that the conqueror claims the land. When we, when we want to identify the, the role of the church, and that we have to get back to the role of the church because that's when it comes to what our role is. We're talking about the church's role in creating the, um, the intellectual discourse by which you're arguing that we are the civilized people and they are the savages and they need to be civilized by our uh, taking them over. So that concept, that we can find Unitarian saying that, you can find Thoreau. If you read close enough, it's there. This idea that we're the civilized ones and we're going to bring civilization to the prairies. Thoreau romanticizes that. Whitman. Right, Emerson too. I mean, now Painter's History of White People really features Emerson a lot. Um, well, let's um, talk about the role of the church now. So you said there were half a dozen Unitarian Universalists there. And I know you and Michael Clyde in 2014 brought this to the attention of the General Assembly in Phoenix. Uh, with other people. And so let's talk a little bit about what we have done and what you think we could be doing. 2012. 2012, whoa, even, even further ago. Yeah, 2012. So about beginning about 2006, 2008, there were requests on the part of indigenous nations directly to the Unitarian Universalist Association to, to join them in the campaign to repudiate the doctrine of discovery. There was letters written by Oren Lyons from the Onagana Nation. There was, there was efforts on the part of John Mohawk from the, uh, I think he's Seneca. So there were efforts being made and um, the, it was addressed in the 2010 men's lecture, it was, the conversation, as you said, there was articles in the CLF newsletter. So the doctrine of discovery was being discussed. And then we, we, we made the, the General Assembly uh, Planning Committee made a decision, had made a decision to go to use the General, have the General Assembly in 2012 in Phoenix, Arizona. But in 2010, legislation was passed in Arizona, making that controversial. I think maybe Michael could pick that up uh, quickly uh, and tell us about what was about that legislation that made it problematic, because we had to think quickly how to have a justice GA. Gosh, you're making me remember it's SB 470, I think it was, that was passed in, in Arizona that- it was 1070. Um, what, 1070? It was a something 70 uh, that, that um, allowed uh, law enforcement to basically racially profile people and uh, demand proof of citizenship, uh, which they used preferentially against brown folks, uh, Latinx and um, indigenous folks in, in Arizona, uh, categories that are not separable, especially in Arizona. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a heinous law, uh, like, you know, and, and, uh, and we said, we can't go to Phoenix uh, with that law in place and have a regular old general assembly. So we have to have a general assembly in which the business is accountable to uh, the people on the ground most affected by this, which, and that was passed, that was 2010 that that was passed, right, Clyde? Mm -hmm. 
Minnesota, at the Minnesota General Assembly, the Minneapolis General Assembly. Yeah. Uh, there was a the 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 it, for the few the months before that General Assembly, the board had passed a resolution saying we won't go to we won't go to to um, Phoenix. The board of the UUA said no, we're not going to go to Phoenix. And you, you, we started Facebook conversation about the, the possibility that Phoenix folks really wanted us to go to General Assembly, except that the Latino community and the indigenous community in Arizona says boycott. So it was like drum was going, drum was boycott, ARE was boycott, but the Phoenix congregations were come and help us and bear witness to this. It was amazing controversy which was solved by the concept of a justice GA, which was, I think was discovered on a Facebook conversation, which you were part of and I was part of and a few other people were part of, but maybe you don't remember it that way. But then that was- No, that's, that's, that's right, Clyde. <laughs> um, but- You were reminded uh, us that uh, Winona LaDuke was the Ware Lecturer in 2010, who also brought this up in, in 2010. Yeah. So anyway, well, tell me this. I mean, this is like in the realm of dumb questions, big questions. But so we were all focused on immigration issues. How are how is the doctrine of Christian discovery related to immigration issues? <laughs> There's a tiny question. But I mean, I, I think it's it is so relevant to the conversations that have devolved since 2010. Um, so I'm just curious how, how you would frame that. For 10,000 years, the, the, the indigenous peoples of North America have migrated back and forth between the Valley of Mexico and Guatemala and Central America and Utah and, and California. I mean, the, 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 the linguistic group that is dominant in Mexico is called Aztecia, Uta Aztecia. And that group is the, it goes all the way to, to Idaho. Uh, those languages are spoken, so the one culture. Uh, and so the concept that the, if you've ever heard the concept, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, and is talks about, the, is addressing that fact that for 10,000 years, those people have been one people and were separated by that war of aggression called the Mexican-American War. So a, that border is a, when you have, have white settlers who, who have been in Arizona for maybe 20, 30 years yelling about border, uh, protecting our border, and who are they protecting against? The indigenous peoples of North America. Yeah, I, I said this when I was in Mexico City, but it was amazing to go to museums where uh, the conquistadors were not in any way seen as heroic. They were seen as violent and oppressive. And it made me realize, you know, even at the Native American Museum, the Smithsonian, there's always this other message going on. And it was just so different to be in a place that just said, no, this, this really was violent aggression. And that's all it was, plain and simple. So, and, and so it's important to note that that um, even with the border, um, there was still migration, um, you know, work migration that was very easy um, in and out of the U.S., the southern U.S., um, until the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the quote unquote war on drugs um, that Border Patrol and migration became um, an easy way to the war on drugs became an easy way to link into increased um, quote unquote border security. So even with that border coming down, you know, with the aggression of the Mexican American war for, you know, decades and centuries after that, folks had very easy access in and out of um, uh, their indigenous uh, territory, of course, you know, the, who's, there was this artificial um, construct that, that was there that, that folks had to go through, but um, it was a very intentional um, thing of closing our borders. 
um, and and the doctrine of discovery just was one of the tools to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. so, right. So I, I live in California and I grew up in San Gabriel, which is where there's a mission. And that was an important part of growing up there. And I just had to do some research about it. Um, and after the doctrine of discovery, going back home, thinking about what were we gonna do moving forward? What were gonna be our next steps as Unitarian Universalists, as indigenous people? Um, and I thought, but over here on the West Coast, it's this different part of the doctrine of discovery. And I actually Googled were the California missions part of the doctrine of discovery. And of course, because there was time in between, nobody's linking it. But if we didn't have the doctrine of discovery in Spain, coming in and trying to make its colonies, they wouldn't have been like, yeah, let's put this role of missions, let's colonize the indigenous people. And a lot of the language, if you just look up any of the missions is all about the Franciscans and what they did and the great stuff they did for agriculture. And somewhere is the footnote of how many uh, people of that particular tribe are buried at that mission or have been baptized. Um, part of the curriculum. It was something that teachers many decades ago thought, oh, this is a way to get students engaged and involved in history is creating these little dioramas and these little mission. Uh, my daughters all did it. Um, and, and I took the opportunity when they had to do that project because we couldn't opt out uh, to really talk about it deeper than just what it was. Um, but yeah, in doing research, just been a call to get rid of that in uh, 2017. Clyde, yeah. Well, I think we should also see it from the other side of the, the ocean here, uh, the Atlantic, uh, where you know we have here in Massachusetts and, and New England, we have churches that date from, I mean, the Plymouth congregation was founded as a covenanting congregation in 1606 in England and brought his covenant over here to Plymouth, Massachusetts. And all of the narrative of, the, uh, of that New England conquest is around the, the idea that they were coming to save the Indian uh, through mission work. And it's, it, the flag of Massachusetts has an indigenous person facing east. And the original cartoon on that flag that was come o help. Thank you for coming over and helping us. That was that was the seal of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that this this idea that uh, it, that the mission was to of, uh, of settling in the United States is a mission based on God's will that this place be civilized by Europeans. Think of that narrative we have of Olympia Brown and all those universalist churches out in uh, Michigan and, New and Ohio, et cetera. The, Olympia Brown's father with his ax chops down trees, builds a cabin, builds a school, builds a universalist meeting house, raises money to bring in a universalist circuit writer. 10 years, 10 years before he arrived there, that land was cleared by federal troops of the indigenous people. So the, the narrative of Unitarianism is intricately developed, not only the Roman Catholics with their missions, but the, the, we ourselves is intricately developed and with this, this conquest narrative. I'm in the Twin Cities where that history is more visible um, and still Fort Snelling, which is where the order for the largest mass hanging in American history took place, is still a place where until three years ago, kids were having birthday parties with the themes of Indians and settlers. And, you know, they're finally, I mean, I, I've been fighting with them really actively. I, I talk to people there a lot because it, it, to me, it feels like I drive by a concentration camp every time I go by it, and it is not seen that way, but they start, the historians there are very, they get it what happened, and they, they want to be more honest, and 
it's moving along. Um, but a lot of the, the militias that really took over and, and wiped the native people out are the families that are have, you know, their houses or mansions that you can still tour kind of things. And so I think getting real history told is, is a, a role that Unitarian Universalists could play because we are connected. And, and our history, in the Twin Cities, I feel like race, and, and I say this as somebody who's been there a long time, but race continues to be talked about as if it's a black white issue. And, and where we are, I'm not saying that the anti-black stuff isn't real and horrible, but there's this, we, we have a huge current population of native, uh, running for Lieutenant Governor, we have a Native American woman. I mean, the Native Americans are not invisible there. And yet still, I feel like the history, even in the UU congregations, disappears all of this. And so I, I, um, I wish that someone, I wish there was a Mark Morrison Reed at work unearthing it in the Twin Cities, because I know who was there when those mass hangings were being ordered, and it was us. Sorry, Clyde. You're going to say something. Oh, that's fine. It, uh, I think uh, you're, 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 it's, it, it's important that so many of us live in places that have indigenous place names: Massachusetts, Minnesota. <laughs> uh, those and the the ninety nine percent of the the white population have no idea what those names mean. I mean, well, that's, that's and a historical amnesia of insanity. If they do, Clyde, it's, it's part of a narrative that relegates indigenous people to history, right? Oh, there were indigenous people here 400 years ago and they're not here anymore, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the name lives on, uh, but you know, that, that history is false too. I mean, you're here, <laughs> you, you're, 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 you're here. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out, Meg, that um, when we talk about all of these issues of racism, we need to understand them as connected to. The doctrine of discovery um, enabled the slave trade, right? It gave Europeans permission to enslave Africans um, and bring them to North and South America. Uh, and so um, the doctrine of discovery undergirds anti-blackness and anti-brownness both, um, because it, it gave a theological justification for white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? So it's connected. Um, and we can't, we can't say there's this, there's this racism and there's this racism and they're not part of the same whole. And we're, we Unitarians, Universalists, Unitarian Universalists, and all white people are are complicit in this in some way. Uh, so I'm interested in this conference and and um, and the things that because the question was what's next, right? I mean, we passed this repudiation in 2012. Um, it was great. We celebrated with the indigenous people who invited us to do that in in Arizona. Uh, and then what? Um, so, so part of it is telling accurate history. Part of it is seeing what history is being taught in our in our local school districts. What what else was discussed at the conference about about what people wanted to see next? So actually, there was a call um, put out that people of faith start writing more about it in our journals, in our publications, um, start talking about it. Uh, there was also a call put out to uh, lawyers to really talk about it and, and have more of a conversation. And uh, Clyde, there were some other people that I, I don't remember exactly because I had to leave early for my flight. So I don't know if there was other things that the last afternoon that you can speak to. I think that what the, the four Unitarian Universalists, what I would emphasize from the conference is the, the, the tremendous link between indigenous claim to the land and the doctrine of discovery is 
empowering corporations and the, and its and its and its instrument, the Army Corps of Engineers, claims to taking over that land and turning it over to corporations, and the environmental crisis. I mean, you have water and air and land, soil being destroyed at an extraordinary rate, which the, is placing our planet in crisis and Unitarian universes in general are awake to this as a crisis. They're also awake to the, uh, they've heard about and, and, and are listening about what's happening in terms of racism. And the, this concept of, of colonialism as an extractive enterprise needs to be part of that conversation because it helps link the our fight against racism and our fight against in, the environmental de degradation to our co role as co colonists, colonial powers. And that, that, I think it's powerful. I think it, my experience as a preaching on the doctrine of discovery and linking it to environmental issues, linking it to justice issues is that the congregations can move if they if it gets out of the you know you want to tell them about the history because it is but you also want to tell them about its impact today on water on land on soil the the fact that Oklahoma is is got gas in the in the water from fracking or the there's uh, pollutants in the Missouri River, all of those things are things that Unitarian Universalist congregations can become, see the connections, because uh, we talk about, we have a, we talk about interconnections, but we don't often, we, uh, we do our social justice work in silos so often. Did you meet people from other denominations who were doing things that you thought were uh, exciting or, or possibilities that we haven't done. I know locally there's a congregational church that's very active with this that I, that I watch. I wonder at the conference if there, were, if there were interfaith partners on the horizon that you saw for you use. Uh, I, there was a, a gentleman um, who spoke at the very end, and he was in partnership with the leadership of the conference that we were at, and they were going to be holding some um, talks and conversations, and they were actually a class they were going to be running at one of the local universities, but I can't recall um, what, what denomination he was. Do you remember, Clyde? I want to say he was actually a Jesuit, because that was part of the interesting conversation. So um, they're, you know, but they're in partnership with people in the, in the community. So I think that's an important part is finding those, those collaborations and those partnerships. But I actually think we need to start in our, in, in our own faith because I've attended some events that are for people of color, you, you people of color and black and brown people are named and Native American and Indigenous are not. Even in those spaces, we have to say we're still here. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do with DRUM is that I know we have an API caucus and they have conference that just happened. Um, and I know we have an Indigenous caucus, but what do we actually do? How are we actually supporting Indigenous people in our faith, uh, congregants, lay leaders, and then especially seminarians and ministers? Um, I know a handful when choosing the pastor, a teaching pastor, I knew of two that I could choose from. When choosing uh, a seminarian to, to be my buddy who had the same understanding, I knew of one. But, you know, how can we support the people in our, in the UU um, who want to do this work, who are in indigenous, uh, and also the youth. So I have a, a son, he's a teenager. He just attended Thrive this summer. Um, but he's struggling with his identity because if you look at Clyde and myself and a lot of the people that were at this conference, we're not the stereotypical look of indigenous people. And that was actually really important to me at this conference 
was to that representation mattered. I had never realized personally how deeply that was until I sat in a conference with indigenous folk that looked like Clyde and myself, not like what the media portrays us, not even growing up in um, the West, what the West portrayed and what I was used to seeing and feeling like a very white person in the middle of that. So my son is really struggling with his identity because he's seen as, as a white boy with privilege and he's having a hard time as a teenager finding his voice to say, well, actually this is my identity. And, um, you know, like when they caucus, when youth caucus, he's often just kind of pointed in the direction of where the white youth are going. And teenagers have a hard time saying, well, actually I identify over here. So one of the things that next steps going forward is um, in talking with the conference leaders in Syracuse was how do we create a youth track for their conference, for perhaps other conferences. So I think that's, again, we, I, I feel a need, a call. I don't know if you hear the baby. Um, I hear, I have a call to how can we support the indigenous people in our faith before we start worrying about more work out in the greater community. Go ahead, Clyde. You don't have to raise your hand. You're muted, though. Yeah, unmute. Uh, well, I think I, what I heard Meg said is there anything that we that the faith other faith communities are doing that might be interesting to us? And I agree agree completely with what has said. Uh, but I think there are models that other faith communities are using. The the <laughs> the first large mainstream denomination was the Protestant Episcopal Church. They repudiated a little before us, I'm not sure, maybe a year. And they, what they did is turn over the Doctrine of Discovery work to a theological school to coordinate the work. They funded that theological school, but they just didn't say do it. They funded it and allowed that theological school to um, to do this kind of Zoom thing with indigenous people and Episcopalian congregations in Indian country that were doing work so that they had those congregations weren't just doing their were just isolated, but they were they were resourced. And that, I think that what when we did it in 2012, we we did assign staff to it, but we didn't assign staff with resources. So you, to do some of the things that Kia talked about, getting a youth track, do developing a ways of connecting, we have perhaps, uh, we have counted congregations with, that are, let, just listen to the congregations and you'll see what I'm saying. Uh, the congregations in Arizona and, uh, and, and Alaska and North Dakota and, 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 and Oklahoma, all, all have significant indigenous members, but they're not connected and they don't go to General Assembly and they're not part of the, the, those works because there's no, what's that word, affirmative action process where you could say, we're going to make an effort to try to activate some of these people, build leadership cadre among these communities. So that's not, that has to be done by somebody and the, we're congregationalists and we've we have a hard time doing centralizing any kind of effort, but I think some kind of institution, CLF or Meadville, somebody taking, doing some of this work with the grant could make a huge difference, huge difference. I'm glad. I think it's important to note that we're congregationalists for a reason, and the reason you know, that you noted earlier um, in how we established ourselves as Unitarians and Universalists and was to, you know, continue to support the status quo and that decentralization of power of, you know, to those smaller congregations where um, white supremacy can flourish um, without that external support of bringing together um, is is very intentional, um, I think, in the way that Unitarian, <clears throat> the Unitarian faith, and to some extent the Universalist faith, 
uh, formed. So I think it's also recognizing that about how that power system is so ingrained in Unitarian Universalism so that we can say, yes, we're Congregationalists, and here's why, and here's part of the reason why um, that that continues to hold us back from doing the things that you're talking about. Because um, I, I agree with, with you and Kia that it's super important that we start resourcing the vision that we see um, because we've had, <clears throat> you know, we've had, we've drum has done visioning work, finding our way home has done visioning work. We always get together <clears throat> and talk about the things that, that we want to be. And those vis- that vision is, you know, it always frustrates, it, now it frustrates me um, because that's not the work. It's, it's the supporting, it's the resourcing of the vision um, is the work. And so, um, you know, yeah, absolutely to, to supporting, um, particularly, you know, just what you and what you and Kia said, um, having those opportunities uh, for youth in particular, um, I was a big proponent of that to be able to explore um, identity formation uh, along with their faith formation. Uh, picking up on something Kia said, it would be helpful for Unitarian Universalists uh, to, there's a, a, a big, in the, the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., there's a huge display of photographs of indigenous people. And if you spend 10 minutes looking at the photographs, you get the notion that there, that the idea that you can tell what an Indian looks like, uh, an indigenous person of North America uh, looks like by just, oh, I know, because I've seen the movie, because there isn't anybody, even including, uh, uh, you know, like your 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 full-blooded Lakota, uh, who isn't told by some white person, "Well, you don't look like an Indian I saw in the movie." So that that's a, that's 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 uh, that's an amazing capacity white people have to figure out who who looks like an Indian. You know, it's, it's magic. It, it <laughs> is. It is magical, and we, and you know, like you said, we run into this those in those issues in our POC communities as well. And I think that it's important in our POC communities to, you know, to talk about that up, up front and, and be um, be real about that, um, particularly for POC like me, like even my, my kids, you know, that as we are nearer to the, um, to being perceived as white, and the privilege that comes with that. And that I think that's, that's a great conversation to have in POC space before we go out and have that conversation in front of, uh, in front of, all, of all of the rest of the community. Um, and, and it would be nice to have some resources to do that because you know, my, my kids are biracial and, um, and you know, there's, there's, a whole host of uh, really complicated, intertwined uh, realities with white supremacy in that. And, and I would love to have a place where, um, you know, we could, we could talk about that. And when Tiger Woods identified as indigenous, it, was, it made a lot of people angry because he was supposed to be black. Hyde Erdick wrote a good piece about this. There's an anthology of people of color living in Minnesota who wrote about what it's like. And she wrote about kind of different communities and how she's perceived and it really so complicated. I mean, I, it's, I, I think these resources you're talking about are so important, especially for the youth. I mean, um, you know, my own kid as an adopted person of color went through tremendous identity questions, which really helped by learning Chinese American history, because, you know, the model minority stuff was really just up front. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot, you know, just to, I, I posted on Facebook earlier this week that um, I just found out that my hospital system has been identifying me as white 
non-Hispanic, not Latino, um, for the past 10 years. And, you know, the, the erasure that comes with, with that of not just ourselves, but our data. And, you know, talking to my kids about how they fill out the census, you know, census is coming up. And, you know, there's this, you know, I even have hesitancy when, when the only choices are, you know, white, uh, black, Asian, and Native American in a lot of, uh, of, of places that are, that are doing choices. Um, you know, I, I know that I can claim that Native American um, title if it, as it relates to where my people are actually from, but that's not how I go through the world. And so how does that then affect you know, the, those communities that I want to support if I'm, if I'm, you know, checking that box. And, and so all of that's coming at you as you're staring at these little check boxes. And, and that's just part of what our youth are going through. I can't imagine, you know, what that feels like for them. Right. And Christina, before um, Native American was an option on many of those, it was uh, Hispanic or non-Hispanic. And as a person who does not identify as either Hispanic or Latina, um, not just the check boxes, but again, within our own faith, within spaces that are supposed to be for people of color, those are kind of the identities. And I've actually been told when I said, oh, well, I, I don't identify as Latina or Hispanic. Well, we're all colonized. This is where you go. And I'm like, where's the space for the indigenous who do not identify? And so how, how can we create that space? And how can we, again, like you said, we need to start having these conversations in those spaces so we can take that conversation larger. Well, thanks so much. We're coming up to the top of the hour. Anything that you wanted to say and didn't get to, Kia or Clyde? Well, we, yeah, I think we, we need to look back at the 2012 Doctrine of Discovery, when the, the General Assembly repudiated the Doctrine of Discovery, it instructed the congregations to go deeper, and it instructed the association to provide resources for the congregations to go deeper. And I think that that provides, that, that it, we, when we pass these things at General Assembly, we're, we, we don't have this theory that it's only operative for as long as we can remember that we did it and the enthusiasm wears off and we go on to the next thing. It's supposed to be something that we do. And we, the, I think we can build on it and revisit it. And I, I, I think we should urge, and I have urged members of the, the association, the board to, re, to, to review what's been done since 2012 and ask whether we are letting it slide. I guess that's a good, could, could there be a review of the, what we've done and are we, are, is it, here is an issue that's becoming more intense in indigenous, the indigenous community was very angry about two, in 2012 about the doctrine of discovery. It's 10 times angrier now because, I mean, because one, you have a whole new generation that understands what it is all about. And two, we have the, all these indigenous struggles around environment going on all over the world, all over the Western hemisphere uh, and connecting with people around the world. So I think that, that that's an important thing for us to do in follow up. Yeah, and following off of that. So when I was at this conference with Clyde and I said, well, we should do a thing. And he said, well, there's supposed to be a group. There's a UUA group that's doing a thing on the doctrine of discovery. And I was like, I remember looking at the website at one point, but the links were dead. And, the, and it was like, yes, this had happened at GA once, but then what going forward? So as a new seminarian, as a UU, I couldn't find that there was actually something that we were doing going forward. It's different now. Like if you go to the UUA website, there is more information, but there was a period where there wasn't any. So like Clyde's saying, what are we actually doing once we make this declaration to live it out? and that it should become part of the fabric so that the youth of today and the youth of tomorrow aren't sitting here asking these same questions. They can point to this curriculum, this actions that we actually are doing. 
Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been a really um, helpful conversation. I know it's making me rethink some things. Next week, we have Takia Amin coming to talk about what the Black Lives of UU are up to, which is pretty exciting. And uh, so we'll look forward to that. Aisha Hauser will be back with us. We have to hear how her adventures went. And any other last words from anybody? Just did you come to say something or just to say goodbye? Just to say goodbye and thanks goodbye. for being here. Goodbye.